Hi all, I think you've got the drill already. If you haven't introduced yourself in the chat, tell us where you're zooming in from and what you're hoping to get out of today. I'm sharing the screen with two friends, Duncan and Darshan, who you're gonna meet in just a few moments. My colleague, for those of us, you who don't know us, my colleague Duncan and I work for a social impact organization called CoGenerate, which works to bridge the age divide in our society. Our mission is to support older and younger people working together to co-create a better future. You'll get to know a little bit more about each of us and our organization during our time together, but here's a little bit about where we're both coming from. And Duncan and I are gonna hold your space today. So we're gonna introduce each other. First, I would like you to meet my colleague, Duncan, who is a proud millennial. Um, his technical title is Digital Communication Specialist for CoGenerate, but he wears a lot of hats around here for any of you who've ever shown up at one of our webinars. He helps to manage our community across many of our programs, networks, fellowships. He is known for several things, iconic Halloween costumes, very cute dog, climate activism, to name a few. And Duncan will introduce me. Thank you so much, Marcy, and I'm so happy to be here putting this on for the CoGenerate community. Marcy and I have been working really hard to kind of hone our knowledge about co-generation in the workplace, and I'm so excited to share it with all of you. But just to introduce Marcy, Marcy, as she introduced me as a proud millennial, as a proud Gen Xer, um, sometimes the forgotten generation, but Marcy's making sure that we don't forget about her. Um, she is at CoGenerate, the VP leading narrative and community. She's also the author of the Encore Career Handbook, which in my opinion is the definitive guide to what we call Encore Careers. If you're um, in midlife looking to make a big change, I couldn't recommend it highly enough. Um, Marcy re writes and speaks often about Encore Careers as well as the multi-generational workforce. Um, and Marcy is, uh, you know, I've been so happy to be in community with Marcy ever since I moved back to New York about five years ago. Um, she and I have been coordinating both inside and outside of work, and she's such an incredible font of knowledge about New York City sites and restaurants and where all the subway stops are. Um, and in general, she's just an incredible listener and connector. The other day, um, we were having a conversation. She mentioned um, an acquaintance of hers was a Broadway producer and expressed deep um, anxiety that she wasn't close friends with him so she could make more connections in her life. Um, and that's really... Um, the way that she she brings that spirit to her everyday interactions. Um, so that's us. Um, and as Marcy mentioned, we can get more into our backstories, our connection to this work as we go. But before we get started, a little bit of context on what we're talking about. America today is the most age diverse society in human history. We've got a quarter of the population under 20, a quarter over 60, and the rest somewhere in between. At the same time, we are arguably the most age segregated nation in history. And this separation of generations contributes to a whole raft of problems, including generational conflict, rampant ageism, and an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. But one place where older and younger people are already sharing space is at work. That's why we believe that workplaces may have the best potential to bridge generational divides and create stronger teams in the process. So today we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to offer some context for talking about age and generation. We're going to make the case for why generational diverse, uh, diversity in the workplace actually matters. We're going to explore some of the common tensions related to intergenerational workplaces. And then finally, we're going to offer some tips, strategies, and models to tap into the power of age diversity. We also want to make sure we are answering your questions and not just at the end. So if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A box. Marcy and I are going to be scanning them to incorporate as we go, um, as well as answering questions at the end of the presentation. So to get us started, I want to share this. This is a generation generation cheat sheet. Um, sometimes I feel like in my role at CoGenerate, I'm kind of expected to know these ages offhand, but I could not possibly keep track of it without referencing something like this. Um, these kinds of generational bands have been in use for decades, at least since the aftermath of World War II. Um, and we know from the registration information um, that the generational mix skews a little bit older. Um, we've got 3% Gen Z, 11% millennials, 
29% Gen X, 51% baby boomers, and 6% silent generation. Um, so I'm going to end the poll I have on screen right now and launch another one. Um, so thinking about the generational bands you see on screen right now, does your working or volunteer life, um, however you want to think about that, involve cross-generational collaboration? So whatever generation you are, are there people who are outside those bands that you're working with in your day-to-day -day life? And we'll give folks a few minutes to, uh, well, not a few minutes, but a few seconds to think about that and respond to the poll. So far, what I'm seeing is an incredible amount of yes. Um, very few people say that they're not connect, collect, connecting across generations, um, which isn't surprising based on um, what I said earlier about the context, how many generations we have in the workplace, how many generations we have um in general um and i think i will pass it over to marcy great great um it isn't surprising and i think we have a little bit of a self-selected group here in that most of you are working across generationally which which is excellent we do not duncan and i have taken this show on a road a little bit we have not had that response in most other audiences where we've spoken so that's really interesting but that's the beauty of our community um, it's been super interesting to partner with Duncan and now with Darshan on this webinar. We have developed a bit of a cross-generational roadshow and it's um, been gratifying and really fun to work together. We have also been getting a lot of comments about our hair these days, especially since Halloween when Duncan dyed his hair kind of RNG and I stopped dyeing my hair a little while ago and Dar Darshan is sporting a very cool new haircut as well. You may wanna show the side Darshan because oh we know it has special features. Okay. What did you call so, it Darshan, a burst fade? Burst fade. Burst fade. Yes, the burst fade. We did not know about that haircut until this morning. So, um, well, we can help noticing and really even commenting on generational and age difference in some ways, we are putting less stock into those generational labels that we just reviewed. Even the Pew Research Center, which popularized those labels, is phasing them out somewhat. Uh, this spring, Pew made an announcement that they would not be relying on these kinds of labels as they often lead to stereotyping and generalizations. So that's super interesting for us. Um, we're kind of keen set on a mindset um, that is captured uh, by the word perennial, which was popularized by Gina Pell. Uh, she came up with this phrase to describe people um, who are kind of uh, relevant across all ages and generations. And it's something I know I aspire to. The definition is ever blooming relevant people of all ages who live in the present time, know what's happening in the world, stay current with the technology and have friends of all ages. Um, we find um, that when we, whenever we talk about generational labels, people seem to warm to this kind of idea and maybe getting out of those silos we're used to talking about. So we have our friend Darshan on the screen and I wanna introduce him and bring him into the conversation because um, uh, Darshan is really important to talking about how these cross-generational relationships are playing out at work. Um, Darshan is part of the Encore Fellowships Program which um, is a program of CoGenerate, which matches experienced professionals with high impact roles in nonprofits and other social sectors organization. Uh, Darshan is an assistant professor of engineering at Arizona State University, and he's in his late thirties, just crossed that Rubicon, I think, too late. Mm -hmm. um, and in this photo, you'll see his partner, uh, Jim Blakely, who is a 60 year old engineer with Intel, uh, from Intel with decades of experience. They met through the Encore Fellowship Program and they have been working on a major project to bring a social and environmental justice lens to the engineering field. Um, Jim could not join us today, but Darshan said he would share some reflect reflections on what it feel has felt like to work on this project with Jim. Uh, Duncan and I have actually talked to Jim and he joined us in a different webinar. So we're going to share throughout some reflections of Jim as well. Um, and in this working relationship, um, Jim came in as this, you know, 60 year old working with Darshan and a bunch of other grad students who were decades younger. And so I want to start with Darshan, your perspective here. Um, 
what was it like to manage manage someone? And I'll put that word in quotes who was, you know, 30 years older than you. Yeah. Well, first of all, before I say anything in regards to that question, I just uh, appreciate this opportunity. And it's just really cool to see all of the engagement that's being shared on the chat. Uh, there's folks from all over the country. And I think I noticed somebody actually at the Mirabella residence at Arizona State University. So special shout out to them. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, you know, I, um, I fell into this Encore Fellowship. It used to be called Encore Fellowship, now Co-Generate Fellowship. Um, uh, quite accidentally. Um, and I had no idea what Encore was until uh, in a matter of two days, I came across Encore twice from completely different sources. And so when I when I looked up um, what the fellowship was about, um, it just seemed like there was a possibility for uh, some kind of cool collaboration to be built. Uh, and I'm very grateful to Jim Emmerman uh, to, to helping me find Jim. Um, uh, at some level, I had really no idea what to expect um, uh, in this kind of program um, and connecting with somebody formally through the lens of intergenerational collaboration. Um, because uh, in general, and especially as an academic now, like I reach out to people all the time who are maybe not my age, right? And like, oh, I just like the work you do. Let's talk. Um, and going you know, going from that kind of modality to sort of maybe hiring somebody who um, uh, is, you know, explicitly from the lens of intergenerational, um, different than me, uh, with a, a, a range of experiences so different than me, was really, really, really cool. And I have always tended to be um, somebody who just likes team stuff. Like I play soccer, right? Like, I just like working in teams, doing things as a team. And as an engineer, you do things in teams. And so at some level, um, working with Jim really wasn't a sort of a managerial relationship. It was just like a collaborative relationship. And it's turned into more than just a professional collaborative relationship. We're very, very close friends now. So, um, you know, I think for folks who are interested in this kind of work, um, it could be that the the person that you are engaging with in an intergenerational capacity actually really wants you to just be part of the team. And like, they're not sort of thinking about you as somebody who's there to do something for the other person, but rather like build something together. So in that sense, it was like truly collaborative and it, it wasn't managerial at all. Yeah, I love hearing that. And that is one thing that we saw in the whole entire Encore Fellowships program in that it's not a traditional manager reporting relationship. Yeah. And a lot of later life work might look like that. Um, so when we talked to you, you said something super interesting about how your cultural background may have mm -hmm. also had some interesting dynamics in working with someone old enough to be your parent. Yes. Um, can you just explain that a little bit? Yeah, I grew up in India and um, I, uh, was never used to calling anybody older than me by their name. I would just say uncle or auntie or sir or madam. Um, and um, that was actually the case when I moved to the US from India, like all my professors are just professor. And my PhD advisor, I still call her professor, mm -hmm. even though I've known her for um, 17, 15, 17 years now. She's one of my best friends. She's just professor to me. Um, and uh, and so, you know, it is it was a bit of um, an acclimatization to be in a place like America um, where, you know, cultural norms are different and how we refer to each other um, um, is different. And, you know, at some level, it's still like I, I call him Jim. Right. But he's still an elder to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so. I would like to think that I'm I'm still sort of giving him the respect that he is due as an elder to me uh, in, in everything that we do. So like, even though it's sort of collaborative, like it's a collaborative thing that we're working on, um, he is still my elder in this process. And so like I, whatever he says, I take very, very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, that respect is is very interesting. And I will say it echoes how he approached you in terms of the respect piece. I mean, when we asked him about the mentoring aspect, he emphasized that the mentoring went both ways all the time. He was as much student as kind of mentor. Um, but he did say there were some issues, and we know this from working with a lot of people on their mm -hmm. own careers, that did show up for him and made him feel and recognize that he was coming into this work team from a different perspective. Things like new norms around DEI that were very, very different than when he was coming up in engineering. In fact, when he was coming up in engineering, there weren't even many women in the field. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that alone was something he noticed he had to get used to people um, identifying themselves with their pronoun pronouns. Um, mm -hmm. Anything, uh, you know, uh, any reactions to you on whether you had to coach him in any of those uh, things or was that kind of a smooth adjustment on your end? Yeah, at least from my perspective, it seems smooth, but you know, I, I did watch the webinar that Jim gave, you know, with you um, a little while ago. And uh, I, I just think it was actually kind of interesting to know that he was processing these things along the way. Um, and I, I didn't know that. Um, so I think, um, I, I think it's actually, it makes a really great conversation you know um uh and now the next time i talk to him which will hopefully be in the next few days i'm actually gonna and i ask him about it um so uh yeah i mean i think um uh i i you know i wonder when these relationships start whether there's actually like a, a cool set of questions that we can have mm -hmm. to really understand how we are different intergenerationally yeah. You know, because and it's it's not that the difference is bad. It's just like it, it just gives me a better appreciation of where somebody like Jim is coming from. Well, hold that thought because we are going to get to that. I see yeah. Duncan smiling. Yeah. You're going to get to yeah. That. You get a sneak peek to later in the presentation today. Yeah. yeah, Darshan, that was all super helpful. Is there any parting thought you want to give us before we continue on? Um, I'm just looking forward to everybody who's in this webinar right now. You know, formally maybe engaging through CoGenerate and finding people to collaborate with and having a lot of fun. Okay. Thanks so much for, for doing this with us, Darshan. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Darshan. Um, and thank you, Marcy, for kind of leading that. Um, I think a term that we have already probably brought up a couple times. I saw someone in the QA asking about it, uh, Deirdre. Um, and it's this idea of co-generation uh, or co-generating. Um, and what you just heard the story about Darshan and Jim is a great example. We define co-generation as the power that's created when older and younger people come together to solve big problems. We see co-generation as a really important aspect of diversity, and it brings new strengths and networks and ideas. So at co-generate, we are working to we're working uh, at CoGenerate, we're working with a growing field of innovators uh, who are looking at all kinds of models that involve bringing older and younger people together for social impact. And that's where so many of our learnings come from. Today, a lot of the examples that we're going to cite, as well as the lessons we're learned, have been from those innovators that we've been working with. Um, so we're sharing those key, le key learnings and tracking what's going on in that world. Um, to give a little bit more context on where we are right now in terms of generational differences, I'm going to show you some research from Stanford researcher uh, Stash Sasha Joffrey. Um, so these blue lines here represent chronological ages at the turn of the last century, at the year 1900. Um, and you can see that the age distribution was shaped, you know, like a triangle. At essentially every chronological age, there were fewer people living. Um, um, now, the orange bars represent the year 2020, um, and you can see that the population distribution looks a lot more like a rectangle. There are almost equal numbers of people at every age, from birth to 70 and beyond. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have about one in four people under 20 and one in four people over 60. Um, what this means is that there are now four generations in the workplace pretty commonly. Um, and even five is actually possible. At this moment, it's possible that a grandparent and a grandchild really could be sharing an office or a Zoom room, as it were. 
And yet we don't really get any training on how to work with people who are old enough to be our grandparents or grandchildren. So I'm going to jump in, but I just want to ask if my sound is okay, because we had a few comments saying that I was hard to hear. Um, I guess Darshan and Duncan, can you just give me a heads up or down? I can definitely hear you. I think you're a little quieter than the two of us, maybe because you have a different camera set up. Um, okay. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Yeah. I will try to enunciate um, clearly. So um, in addition to the, the demographics that Duncan just reviewed, there is um, another nuance to keep in mind, um, which is that we talk about age and generation and lifestyle and life stage, and they are sometimes used interchangeably, but they are not the same thing, and they all intersect here. So there will always be younger and older people in the workplace. That's age. We all have experienced that um, in the own our own way of joining the workplace. Um, there are also influences that shape us based on when we are born. For example, those whose college years or first jobs coincided with a pandemic may have been shaped by the idea of virt virtual work is normal, normal to go to Zoom meetings. Um, those in, who grew up in the 1950s often refer to themselves as the duck and cover generation because of the drills in school teaching kids how to hide under their desks in the event of a nuclear attack. Those things are generational. And then there is life stage. Are you living in your parents' home? Are you raising young kids? Are you empty nesting, caring for aging parents? These things are all about life stages. So in, in prior periods, we tended to move through our lives in kind of lockstep fashion education, marriage or not, kids or not, potentially grandparents, grandkids, if you um, had children who had children, then retirement. And I would say today, all of that has been thrown into um, a, a whole new way of creating your own adventure, creating your own life script. There really is no one life script, script that's standard anymore. People could be in their first jobs in their 20s, working alongside people in their 50s, 60s, or 70s who are career changers or who have just got a new degree. Um, it's very likely that we could share other life stages like caregiving or returning to school, leaving the military, starting a new career with people of vastly different ages and generations. So the big takeaway we want you to have here is that age, generation, and life stage they all play a role in how we show up at work, how what we're looking for, and how we relate to others. So let's um, dig a little bit into the age piece of this, because working across age divides isn't always easy. And like the reason this is an interesting topic is that it doesn't always come naturally. And when we ask about tensions related to age differences in the workplace, or when we see them in our community of innovators, these are the ones we see and hear most often. Number one, ageism. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with this. Um, that's stereotypes and assumptions about people based only on their age. Um, and I know this is a, a crowd that skews a little bit older, so I know anyone over 45 or 50 can definitely attest to seeing the effects of ageism in the workplace. Um, but many young people can experience it as well. It can take the form of being passed over for opportunities, being taken less seriously at work. Um, I'm sure a lot of folks uh, in the audience today have examples of ages and that they've experienced or that they've seen. A second tension we see is a lack of belonging. You've probably heard about DEI. Marcy mentioned it before when we were talking about um, Jim and Darshan's relationship. Um, DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and sometimes I think inclusion is not treated as an equal part of that equation, but it's so important, especially I think when you're when you're talking about differences across age, hiring an older or a younger person might make your organization more diverse um, in terms of age, but it's equally important for that person to feel welcome and included. Then there's the big one, which is power dynamics. Um, depending on the environment, this can manifest in in totally different ways. You know, for example, um, I think a lot of people would be familiar with in politics right now, especially national politics, we see a lot of examples of older people continuing to hang on to power. Um, you can contrast that with the tech sector, um, where older people are sometimes completely absent um, and younger people have a lot more power. Um, it's really worth wrestling with this dynamics. One really kind of fascinating 
Um, development and something that Darshan touched on is that in the near future, the majority of working Americans are going to have a younger boss. So if you're not thinking about these dynamics yet, you probably will have to in the near future. Um, and the last tension we see are just feelings of insecurity and discomfort around people who are older than younger than you. Uh, I think anyone who spent time with a teenager can attest to how uncool it can make you feel. Um, and that's a reality of age diverse workforces that we don't want to gloss over. Um, because our society is largely age divided outside of work, we are not really attuned to making these connections. And sometimes there can be those uh, social differences there that can make those connections a little bit harder to make. So I'm going to launch another poll now. Um, and this one's going to be asking about a couple of experiences you may have had that could be tensions um, or maybe they're just experiences about um, ways that you've uh, connected across generations in the workplace. So number one is, have you ever had a younger boss? Number two has is, have you ever been asked to speak on behalf of your generation at work? Um, and number three is, have you ever felt disregarded because of your age? And I will give folks uh, a couple of seconds to fill that out, kind of watching the results come in here. Um, it looks like in this audience, we've had, you know, based on the people who've responded so far, about two thirds of people have had a younger boss, um, which is a little surprising. I think that's that's more than the average. Maybe it's because we have that older crowd. Maybe again, as Marcy said, it's because of kind of a self-selecting audience, people who are willing to put yeah. themselves out there and be in those kinds of positions. Um, interestingly, um, not a lot of people have felt like they've been asked to speak on behalf of their generation at work. Which is interesting. I've I've definitely been asked to speak on behalf of my generation at work, and I feel like that's a common experience. But it's so interesting to see that for this audience, it's a little less common. Although I don't want to discount that thirty percent of you feel like you have. And then finally, about sixty five percent of people say they have felt disregarded because of their age. Um, and when I was talking about ageism, I mentioned how common an experience that is. Um, and it's something that we think that being really conscientious about co-generation, working across differences, has the potential to, um, uh, to affect and change for the better. Um, so it's really interesting. Thank you for continuing to interact with us. It's really interesting to kind of see how all this is landing with people. So, you know, considering um, all those tensions, the fact that this is not always easy, I think it's also important to take a minute to talk about why we should care about working across generations. So I wanna offer a few reasons, and you can see three of them on screen here. Um, number one is that age diverse workplaces can lead to better results. There are reams of evidence supporting the value of diverse teams, better performance, wider array of perspectives, um, even higher profits. Um, and while the research on diverse teams can inform the discussion about age diverse teams, age diversity hasn't really been on the research radar, but we know some things about why age diverse teams have enormous potential. Another example I want to bring in from our community um, is from Northern, California, Northern Santa Barbara County, United Way in Southern California, um, and their homeless outreach teams. Their clients range in age, of course, because anyone can experience homelessness. Um, and because of that, they found that their outreach teams were much more effective when they were age diverse. The clients had a higher chance of seeing themselves reflected and were less likely to feel alienated. Um, and you can kind of take that example and see why other teams would want to have access to people of different ages. Number two is that age diverse workplaces can connect us to people across other kinds of difference. Um, one of the realities of today's U.S. demographic breakdown that we didn't talk about when we were just talking about age is that the younger population is much more diverse along lines of race and ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation uh, than the older population is. Um, so when you're connecting across generations, it's very likely that you're going to be connecting across other forms of difference. And unlike other forms of diversity, age is something we all share. Um, we were all younger once, and we all hope to become older. And additionally, everyone has older and younger people in their lives. In that sense, we're basically hardwired to connect across generations, starting with our families. Um, though, of course, we're also hardwired to have some of that conflict, starting with our families. Um, so when we share a common goal, like a work project with people who are older than younger than us, we may be meeting and connecting with people different from us in other parts of their identity. 
Um, and finally, uh, we can reduce ageism when we have age diverse workplaces. There's evidence that simply being around older and younger people can reduce ageism. It's called contact theory. And just representation matters too, which means that when we see positive images on TV and social media or even ads, those images can reduce the stereotypes we hold around certain groups. And we've seen the effect of this in a lot of areas like LGBTQ representation on TV and ads or brands that are embracing different body types. And in the age diversity conversation, it's why we're big fans of shows and movies like Hacks and Only Mur Murders in the Building or the movie I saw last weekend, The Holdovers. Um, all of them use humor to convey that older and younger people really do need each other. And it's both types of contact, the real life and the ones we absorb through media, and they can both shift stereotypes and ultimately our behavior around people who are much older and younger. Um, so I want to give you another opportunity to participate just based on the three concepts on screen. Um, which one of those resonates with you? Um, and if you do have a quick example, feel free to share it in the chat. Um, so to repeat, uh, you see three on screen here, better results, connecting across difference and reducing ageism. Which of those resonates with you and anything about that you'd like to share? Let's see. Um, JG says connecting across differences. We have to talk about differences more, not less. Humanize our community. Totally agree. I think just being aware of these things is such an important piece of the puzzle. Um, better results, Steph from CoGenerate says that that's totally true of our team. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, just this collaboration I've done with Marcy has been um, so valuable, something that neither of us could have done on our own. Um, reducing ageism, says Dr. Robinson. Um, reducing ageism, reducing ageism, better results, better results. None of the results are really coming in. Um, Marcy, are there any other short stories that you've seen in the chat that you wanted to elevate? I mean, just everybody is going with better results and reducing ageism um, and connecting across differences. Someone wrote here, as a seasoned teacher, younger teachers were much more open to new ideas. Um, yeah. So... And I think that came out, Darshan, in your story, too, about some of the differences that you and Jen naturally kind of inhabited. By the way, I just want to say, if you see me looking over or looking down, I am both responding to things in the Q&A and looking at the chat on another screen. So that is why my uh, contact is all over the place. Um, uh, Duncan, yeah. you want me to go on to the next? Uh... Yeah, I think so. I'm just I'm appreciating all the responses that keep rolling in. Um, but okay. Marcy, I'm going to pass it over to you. Yeah, it's a really interactive group. Keep that interactivity um, coming, everybody. So we actually want to give you some ideas for how to leverage the age diversity we're talking about in ways that can make you more effective at work and possibly happier. And I think, Darshan, you, you touched on both of those by saying, like, you know, better results, but also friendship and just kind of enjoyment. Um, so the first, again, is something we saw exactly in Darshan and Jim's um, story, which is, uh, we think, uh, as we've seen in all the work we've been supporting, that it's really important to, to start with connecting over a shared activity or project. Um, very few people are going to be able to, to form these relationships without some reason that brought you together. So we've see, we see this over and over again. Um, we've also seen organizations um, that are creating ways for people to foster cross-generational friendships, and relationships beyond the 101. So several companies, um, Salesforce, a few others we've been talking to, now have employee resource groups that are designed to intentionally bring people together across generational or age differences. So to us, this is a huge development. Um, and one thing we've also learned, though, is that these cross-generational relationships take trust, and tr um, trust takes time. So it, it's if you are connecting over difference, and this is true, not just across age, but other kinds of difference as, as well, how can you build in some time to just build trust for people to get to know each other as human beings? So ongoing relationships, relationships that have enough time and space to build trust, really, um, we've seen have the best results. Uh, the second, again, I think comes right out of uh, Darshan and Jim and the Encore Fellowships model, which is consider cross mentorship in your organization, on a team, 
I think Duncan and I live into that every day. Duncan, I mean, I hate that this is stereotypical, but Duncan is my tech savior in many instances. I've been coaching Duncan a lot on public speaking, something I've been doing for decades, um, but we have many other ways that we think of it as a cross mentorship. Um, many workplaces have adopted this now and they're encouraging two-way mentorship arrangements where pairs are actually fixed up to be cross-generational mentors, but you could start something like this uh, wherever you work or volunteer. Um, Ours is organic, Duncan and I were not matched, um, but it was intentional that we go to each other and try to understand what each person brings to the occasion and, and um, what, it, what our unique gifts are and how we could take advantage of those. Um, so sometimes those things are work skills like finance or accounting or adeptness at PowerPoint or some other technology. And sometimes it's lived experience like, um, Tapping into our age peer networks, for example. So if you're looking to reach beyond your own network, someone who's older or younger than you probably has an entirely different network than you do. And that's something to consider. And Darsha, I think you talked about that when you and Jim were trying to reach private sector firms where Jim has spent you know, a 40, 30 or 40 year career and you didn't have any of those contacts. So we're seeing that a lot. Um, Next one is to, to think about when you are building a team, how you can have age diversity in the mix. Where can you have co-leads on projects, on committees? Um, if it's hard to do at, at work because you don't have the ability to hire, um, what about doing this in a volunteer project or bringing someone in your team who is a consultant who brings a very different age perspective? In our organization, we've taken this to an extreme. We now have co-CEOs who call themselves a co-generational pair. Um, we believe that the CEO or executive director job is way too big for one person. So any of us who know our co-CEOs, we have Mark Friedman, who is our founder, um, who's in his 60s, and Eunice Lynn Nichols, who has been part of our work for her almost her entire career, and she's in her mid 40s. So they have at least a generation between them. They have other kinds of differences as well, gender, cultural backgrounds, and they bring really different uh, complementary skills and perspectives. And they also recognize that this is way too big a job for one person. So that kind of model helps against burnout and helps with sustainability, thinking about the future and stability of an organization. And then the last thing, yes, that's something, Dar Darshan, you planted this seed earlier in our conversation, which is we have this um, exercise we love that was um, created for us by Marina Kim, one of our board members. It's called How I Work Best. And the idea is um, this is something you can do at the beginning of a working relationship with someone of another generation. And you could create a little How I Work Best cheat sheet or questionnaire and then you and your colleague can complete it. It could be like a mini user guides to working with you. So your communications preferences, do you like email, calling, texting? Are you good with spontaneous drop bys? How do you like to get your feedback? Do you like it as it happens? Do you prefer it at regular designated intervals? How do you structure your day to be most productive? Like, do you go to the gym in the middle of the day or do you um, are you available early in the morning or after hours or do those things uh, bother or offend you? So we have created a little generational and kind of get to know you cheat sheet and you're going to have it in the follow up email that you receive. Um, and we'd love to know if you're using it, if it's been helpful. So, I, you know, I just want to close with with giving you this thought that while we really do believe that issues related to generational and age are real, we also want to suggest that age is never the only thing in the room. Uh, lots of people in the comments have been talking about intersectionality and age is intertwined with all the other identities and personal qualities that we bring into our work. It is the ultimate example of intersectionality and it's one of the many forms of diversity that can expand us personally and make our teams and our organizations more effective. That's why we love the how I work exercise. Um, and yes, it may surface some habits that map a little bit to age and generation, like a preference for email over chat or 
whether you got were comfortable using Slack if you're, you know, in your job or you prefer other methods. But it could also help us realize that our new teammate wants feedback delivered in a specific way that has nothing to do with age, stage, or generational differences. So we we would say um, hold this as important, but don't give it too much important. Um, so I want to take a moment to step back and really scan. Duncan's usually so good at this, at, at gathering questions, but give us a couple of minutes to surface some of the good questions that we can take now, because you have been nonstop on lobbing questions at us, and we have a little time, and Darshan's agreed to stay and answer questions at as well, so let's look at what we got. Duncan, you want to try the first one, and I'll keep looking. Sure. Um, and yes, we appreciate all the questions that have come in. Um, just uh, just a basic question, because I know a lot of people have been asking about this. Um, we are going to send a follow-up email either later today or tomorrow that will include um, the recording. It's going to include the slides. We can include the transcript of the chat. And we'll definitely include that How I Work Best exercise. Um, in addition to links and resources for the research we've mentioned today, other things we haven't even mentioned. Um, so if you're wondering, like, how can I have access to something, we'll, we'll add it all there. Um, but that's just a, a kind of a, um, a housekeeping question. In terms of, uh, we've gotten so many great questions here. Um, we can start with one that we just got recently. What are the implications of technology and communications changes in helping or hindering co-generational activity um, from anonymous? It's a really interesting question. Um, because it's kind of, I mean, I think in a sense, it's kind of the number one thing people think about when you think about challenges between generations. And I think that it can either be um, overemphasized or underemphasized. Um, some people think, um, you know, it is, it, it, it's simple to just to bring people up to speed or to do the how I work best and kind of figure out like what works best. Um, but I also think it's, it's not to be dismissed that the differences between digital natives and, and folks who have um, come into that world in their adulthood uh, can be very stark. And those communications challenges can lead to real division, um, right? Like, I think, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to dismiss that. And I think it can be really easy to do. So I think that's, that's one of the biggest things to pay attention to is when you're working across generations, like have these folks grown up in a totally different communications environment than you have and be really conscious of that um, kind of those how I work best exercises that we talked about can be a good catalyst a launching point for starting to think about those questions um, and really having deeper conversations because one of the things about technology and um, modern communication styles is that some of our communication can get very surface level can get very short um, and really engaging on a deeper level, getting to know each other is one of the most important elements of, of cross-generational connection that's really building somewhere. Um, but if Darshan and Marcy have other thoughts, um, happy to turn it over to you. Leaning in. Um, I'll share something uh, that especially struck me um, this past year or two um, as a professor at Arizona State University. Um, it's seeming to me that the use of some kind of technological mediator in um, in connecting with people, in fact, is not just having challenges across generations, but also within generations. So um, I have noticed that students themselves um, aren't connecting with each other in a way that I would hope for them to connect, to be able to learn together well. Mm -hmm. um, so while um, while certainly uh, there's um, wonderful benefits that we can reap from being able to communicate with each other, with each other quickly and internationally, um, I have actually found that there are important questions that we should be asking intragenerationally too um, mm -hmm. around the use of different kinds of technology for communication. Yeah. That's great. Relates to Duncan and I had a call with somebody for a private talk we're doing yesterday. And one of the things she said that really struck me was that um, it, it's important to have also when you're introducing people to the work tools they will be using and the communication tools, 
that there should be a safe space for people to say, I need more help, or I don't know how to do this. And Duncan and I have had this. I mean, I remember a stepped call where I think it was Duncan or somebody else just assumed we all knew how to do something. And then right afterwards, like in the middle of the meeting, I, I raised my hand and I said, I do not know how to do the thing you just mentioned. And it made it safe for other people to also say, I don't know how to do that. I would, And then we just offered like, and right away, our head of operations said, hey, for anybody who needs that, let's jump on a separate call and we'll teach you and we'll have a group teaching about it. So I think to create safe environments where people are comfortable saying what they don't know, and that can happen when you're onboarding someone, but it could also happen with regularity and people can talk to obstacles with using various tools um, and not feel embarrassed to have to admit that. Um, I want to segue to a question that I like from Yael, which is talking about um, my work is dedicated to using play through the lens of improvisational theater games to help people connect across generations. And I've been doing it with workplace teams. We've found that when people play together, they drop their defenses. What experience does co-generate have with using the power of play? And so I'll start with that, but Duncan, I'm, I bet you have some answers too. We're firm believers in play. We just got back from a staff retreat where we had some really fun uh, play time with like an exercise with keeping a balloon uh, toss in the air and a puzzle with a string and I don't know, cups. And so uh, those kinds of play kind of team exercises um, are like any other shared experience. Like if you can create a shared, we did art together. Like we've done some things like that on our internal team, but we worked with lots of fellows um, and innovators who are doing things like using dance and movement to get people of different ages um, in a space of comfort before they go and try to do some work together. So Duncan, any other Thoughts on that yeah, I, I I was just gonna say we have lots of arts organizations um, in our community, um, and it I I think one of the important things that you're doing, Yael, is you're kind of pulling out the importance of play as a really important so piece of social impact, right? Um, that you know I think I think that I've touched on this before, but one of the most important ways to bridge differences of any kind is just uh, proximity and shared goals um, and creating those situations, as Marcy said, is most important. I wanted to highlight one other organization just because I was reminded of it because the word play has two definitions. There's an organization an organization I love here in New York, uh, part of the New York Theater Workshop uh, called Mind the Gap, um, which brings um, older people, people over 60 together with high schoolers to interview with each other, um, develop really close relationships, and then write and perform short plays based on those experiences. Um, so maybe free association there with play and play, but also there is that element of artistry and fun involved that I think is so important. So I just want to, um, I so appreciate that, Duncan, and I want to lift up this as a comment, not a question, but from someone I really respect, Jeanette Liardi, who wrote, the stereotype of older adults not being able to handle technology is easily refuted by number one, viewing stats, describing older adult use of social media and purchasing of tech products, and two, realizing that older adults have decades of experience with tech change from rotary phones to smartphones, for example. Mm -hmm. Understanding how our brains change as we age and our requirements for different teaching techniques will help ease older adult comfort with learning new tech. I just appreciated that comment very much. And from our own team, I do have to say, when I joined, um, when I joined this organization, our in-house tech expert was the oldest person in our organization, and all of us went to him as Jim Emmerman Darshan, who you know. All of us went to Jim for every tech question we ever had, regardless of our age. So uh, I've seen that personally, but I think it's very important, and we should be mindful, Duncan, to not use tech so much as an example, because I think yeah. that. Um, that really hit me. Um, Duncan, do you have another question you're lining up? Um, well, there's a question here from Jim. Hi, Jim. Uh, Jim McGinley, who um, likes the thinking in a book that I haven't read. Maybe you're familiar with Stage Not Age, Marcy, um, uh, versus using those generational labels. Um, and I would like to speak just a little bit more on our thoughts on generational labels, because that's a topic that we really moved on in the time that Marcy and I have been working on this presentation and thinking about age in the workplace. 
As Marcy mentioned at the top, um, it was during the time we were developing this that Pew announced they would stop using those labels. And we've been really influenced by the work of Bobby Duffy, who kind of influenced our thinking on age, generation, and life stage um, in thinking more uh, expansively about the ways that we see each other, both in terms of age and other related areas and trying to be a little less focused on, on those generational labels. Um, you know, I still think they're really helpful and they carry a lot of societal weight, um, but they can also serve to um, deepen stereotypes. I think a lot of folks are familiar with the ways that their generations have been described. Um, you know, me as a lazy entitled millennial, um, I'm, I'm familiar with some of that. Um, and so, yeah, I think we've often seen in our community a resistance to those generational labels. So when we talk about perennials, when we talk about that Q data, that's something we're thinking about a lot. Yeah, that said, we've actually been using them on our, in, in you know, you join a webinar and we yeah. actually ask you your generation. And one of the reasons um, it has to do with trying to know who's in our audience, trying to, uh, and we may change that to age going forward and kind of abandon the use of the generational labels, but we're trying to build an audience that is age diverse. So that's one of the reasons, that's the reason why we track generations in the way that we have, but we're gonna revisit whether that's the right, whether the labels really matter. Um, we get uh, several questions asking how to get involved in our work, how to partner with CoGenerate, how to get involved in Encore Fellowship. So, I just want to make sure we um, address those issues. So um, we do a variety of things here at CoGenerate. We run many, many programs, which you can review on our website. And the most important thing, which I'm guessing all, uh, all of you are on our website or following us on social media, we're in all the places. Um, so that's the way to know what's going on. We um, have a very robust calendar of public events, usually one to two a month like this that dig into issues related to co-generation in different spaces, in different um, uh, parts of our lives. Uh, we often run innovation series that are topical. Um, and then we do some very intensive deep dives. So we're working right now on something called the Cogen Challenge, which um, our first Cogen Challenge is on economic opportunity. So we're so going to be supporting a team of innovators, a cohort of innovators who all have an innovative model to bring generations together in a way that advances opportunity for economic opportunity for all. So as part of that, we'll be doing a lot of thought, external thought leadership around economic opportunity from a cross-generational lens. We will be announcing other challenges going forward. Uh, so keep your eyes open for that if you are an innovator yourself or just want to learn more about that area. We are working on, we also, um, are working on, on ways to do this kind of learning um, more openly, but also to bring people in our community together for socializing, for mixing. So this is a webinar style event. We do these sometimes where it's much more teaching, sharing what we've learned, answering questions, but we also offer many events that are far more social where people have breakout groups and get to know people in their geography. Um, we're experimenting, we hope, with the idea of some in-person salons in the coming year. So I would say watch out for that. Um, it's a bit in the experimental mode. Um, and if you are, um, uh, have an organizational interest in partnering with us, for now, I would say the best thing to do is to write to Dun Duncan or me. If you are interested in Encore Fellowships, in hosting an Encore Fellow or uh, becoming an Encore Fellow, I would go to the Encore Fellowships link on our website, and I'm gonna ask someone to put that in the chat. Someone from our team will do that. Uh, it will also be in the follow-up materials. Um, anything else, Duncan, on the how to work with us? Have I left anything out? I think that was a really good answer, Marcy. I appreciate it. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions here. Um, one another question from Yael was talking about the intersection of ageism and sexism. Yael, Yael says women tend to be more discriminated against as being either too young or too old. Um, and I think that's absolutely true. Um, you know, we touched on the ways that bridging generations are going to bridge other kinds of differences. Um, and 
so much of the work that we do and what we've discovered about connecting across ages applies to bridging all kinds of difference. We really try to bring some of that rigor and think about uh, the specificity of connecting across ages, but we really hope that doing so is going to be a really important strategy for developing all kinds of social good. Um, the kinds we talked about, the innovators in our community who are working on homelessness, who are developing sustainability in the engineering field, Darshan, or some folks in the chat who are uh, working on climate issues. It's all really important, um, but just that contact um, can really help us bridge all kinds of division, or at least we hope it will. And that's such an important issue um, in the United States and the world right now. Yeah, I'll just add that um, ageism and sexism is not the only um, kind of intersection that matters. We have a mm -hmm. lot of community working on the intersection of age and race. We all know there are longevity um, disparities, but also the compounding of different kinds of um, oppression, you know, poverty intersecting, intersecting with age is obviously another complexity to wrestle with. So we're aware of all of that. And in our network, we have lots of people uh, doing really important work on those intersections. Um, I want to close with one quick question. Joanne asked the question, how do we educate the various younger generations about working with elders when much of the media include Medicare showcases uh, and Medicaid, including Medicare, showcase it in such a negative way. I'll just say two ideas that come to mind. We are big fans of all kinds of storytelling initiatives and media and photography efforts that are now underway to change how we depict um, midlife and aging. Uh, Getty has had an effort here. Our friends at NYU have been doing work around that. Our friends at the Modern Elder Academy are trying to reframe how we think about midlife and aging. Um, but we're, um, as Duncan said, we're really paying a lot of attention to what is happening in popular media and culture. And artists and musicians and television and streaming and the stories we see on the big and small screen have a lot to do with how we're thinking about what it means to age. So uh, we will continue to trumpet those stories when we see them that we think are modeling um, good representation of aging. And we are also working on ways uh, to get involved with some of those storytelling efforts uh, and hope to have things to announce going forward because that's a, a huge, we know it can have a lot of impact just as it has had with other kinds of representation. Um, so uh, we will be paying attention and Joanne, knowing that you are in LA and connected, we'll be reaching out to you for sure. All right. Thank you so much, Marcy. It was a really good answer. I so appreciate all these really good questions and so many people for showing up today and being so engaged. I'm going to launch one last poll um, just as a final thought on today's event. Um, just asking after attending this session, are you inspired to include more older and younger people in your life? Um, and I just want to thank you again um, for being here, for asking good questions. And as a reminder, I'm going to send a follow-up email that's going to include the uh, that's going to include the recording, the chat. I can include the slides. Um, so many things folks asked for the how I work best exercise. All of it's going to be in there. So keep an eye in your inbox for that. Um, Marcy and Darshan, thank you so much. Any last words? Okay. Generate. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.